Hi, I'm uh, Rezvan. I'm a BI developer slash data analyst at uh, Levi9 here in Yash. Okay. So what does your job consist of? My job, my job consists of working with data and working with charts and trying to drive that value from the data and ultimately communication, I would say, making sure people understand uh, what we're doing with those reports. What kind of people that have what kind of hobbies or interests who should mm -hmm. want to become data analysts? Who is this job for, mm -hmm. in your opinion? So maybe uh, I can take two steps back and sort of discuss about what is, I think, now the most common sort of structure for data teams. From my experience and also from, from a lot of our companies you can see now uh, in, in the market, the people in uh, the data teams are divided in three. So you have the data analysts, you have the data engineers, and then you have the data scientists. And uh, in my mind, all of these uh, teams have different backgrounds and sort of different um, personality traits that fit better and all that stuff. So I would say the data engineers are the most developers from, from us, uh, available in our department and I think across the board. So CI, CD stuff, pipelines, uh, the testing, all this stuff, repositories and everything you usually use in development. All the people that get the data do what we call uh, ETL, extract, transform, load, or ELT now, extract, load, transform, according to technology you use, uh, making sure that data comes day by day and is accurate, making different checks. Security aspect of it is very, very important as well. Retention, you also have to handle your data, GDPR, and now the AI Act have a lot of regular regulations, especially in the EU you know, any possible cyber threats, that's something you also have to keep uh, keep in mind. And I would see engineers more with a uh, IT background, uh, definitely code, you need to, to, to do that a lot. A lot of patience and a lot of uh, willingness to stay a longer time with the data than maybe you would initially imagine. That that would be my profile for, uh, for data engineers. For data scientists, I'm gonna leave analysts at the end, I think it's more the statistics, math territory. There's, uh, if you really want to understand how a machine model works or even AI for that matter, you got to know math and you know, like deep math. Uh, if you want to get to the point of actually understanding what makes a model perform good or bad. A lot of the work that's done with machine learning models is a bit black boxed as in you get a prediction, let's say, out of it, but you don't know exactly how the model got to that uh, to that point. So that's more like like math again, uh, analytical person, and uh, being able to, to to stay with himself and with the data for a long time. And then there's the data analyst. What I would say again, very you have to be an analytical person because you're going to look at numbers and, and graphs all day. But uh, what is extra, I think, and quite quite. Uh, important is the ability to communicate. So sometimes, or a lot of the times, my position is between the business and our IT team, where we have to translate uh, business needs and um, fix that, make a lot of sense to the business to translate that to our data engineers and our data scientists that are interested more in you know, coding stuff and the uh, structure of the data and type of data and things like that. And you have to be able to have patience with people, ask a lot of questions, go back and again uh, a couple of times, uh, you're not going to find the answers from the get-go. And I think uh, a background in uh, economics is going to help you a bit more. Uh, the, the kinds of things you, we, we talked about and you showed me like decluttering and things like mm -hmm. that, it's even visual communication, so even yeah. a bit artistic, so to say, to some, in, in some way, like the ability to understand visual design and, and how mm -hmm. the human mind goes for visual elements and color theory and all yeah, those kind yeah, of things yeah, yeah. also become part of it. So it's, an, it, it's a mixture of quite yeah. different fields in a way. Yeah, so I've been uh, struggling with this topic a bit myself as well and I kind of changed my mon mind on it. There is a certain degree of subjectivity as a, a dashboard designer or a data analyst because there is Art is a bit too much, let's say, but there is some sort of creative work you have to put into that to make across, to, to, to put your, what you feel is the truth, to put it out there and to be uh, understood, like making as much as an effort as possible that people intu intuitively understand from your dashboard what you wanted them to understand. So that's communication, right? Yeah. What I have in my mind to be communicated to you and you understand the same thing that I'm thinking. Yeah. Cognitive overload. Yep. So 
I think we all have an idea about what that means or we can have an intuition about what it means. But what does it mean in the context of data visualization? Yeah. So especially for people that are newer in this field, the initial feeling you have when you're designing these dashboards that contain several graphs, right, is that you want to give as much information and as much analysis as possible in, in one page. And um, this can uh, end up with a result that people see a lot of stuff, but they don't understand anything. Because uh, the, the cognitive load is, you know, we're all, especially in this uh, day and age, our attention span is quite limited. So when you're throwing a lot of information at me, and when I mean information, it's not just the analysis. I mean also colors, maybe too many graphs, maybe too many filters, maybe too many uh, parts that are text. I don't know where to put my focus on. So every dashboard should have one or maybe two straight messages that you should receive straight away by looking at them. Yeah. Uh, this makes me also think about uh, another concept that I'm really fond of, which is called decluttering. For me, this term was made popular by a uh, very um, interesting data analyst in the United States. Her name is uh, Cole Nathlick. She also has a great book. Uh, it's called Storytelling with Data, and she addresses uh, a lot of these terms of how to make your, your dashboards look better, how to make your charts better, um, highlight the uh, nuggets of information that you found in your exploratory phase of the data. Well, I've heard about this term, decluttering, used in a lifestyle sense. Mm -hmm. So people trying to live a more minimalist life, like having fewer things, yep. not having things they don't need, have, not having things they don't use, um, and just simplifying all the aspects of their life. And I, I guess it's kind of a similar idea. And, yep. and how, do you, how do you do it? Uh, one way is, of course, to show fewer things mm -hmm. on mm -hmm. the screen. Yep. How else do you declutter? I have something for that as well. So this is an example taken from her website. Alongside the book, she has a blog and a podcast, a lot of stuff, but she also takes uh, exercises. Like he, she takes uh, graphs or dashboards that were thumbed up by her clients that, okay, you can use this to highlight a point, you know, maybe anonymize the data, but you can, you can use that. And that's it's a great resource to sort of highlight that information. This is the example I picked to highlight this uh, meaning. So this is a column chart that has a pretty, uh, it's an easy to understand um, element that it wants to highlight. So it's about when do shoppers begin shopping for Christmas specifically. Oh, okay. And it's divided by men and women, as you can see in this uh, legend up top. The y-axis is from 0 to 50%. The x-axis is a bit strange because it's not very consistent, right? It's before September, September, October, and then first two weeks. Yeah. But that's all right. And it's just a lot. It's very simple data. Mm -hmm. there's, there's nothing complicated here. We're not talking about quantum mechanics. Somehow I find it hard to kind of read it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> my, my eyes go all over the place and don't want to settle anywhere. Also, I think what's very missing from this is what's the main story here? What, what, what is the nugget of interesting oh, information yeah. you found out from it, right? So what she does is she takes charts like this and then she declutters them, brings them to a more simpler information. And uh, this is how it looks afterwards, right? So uh, the y-axis is removed because we already have the percentages in the bar chart as a data label. The colors are toned down to just highlight the things that we're interested in. No 3D, uh, that's maybe a good base <laughs> case practice. It's much harder for us to determine comparison when the elements are in 3D, so 2D is the, is the way to go. And also, I think maybe mostly important, she has the, the, the important information up top in the t title, right? So, what she drove from this data is that more women start their holiday shopping early versus men, right? So we see that the uh, pink bars are higher before uh, Christmas, and as you go towards Christmas, less and less uh, uh, women shop. And it's the other way around, yeah. Because yeah. that's the main difference and the main conclusion, yeah. Yeah. So uh, we see the decrease in men as well, but you know, women plan better for, uh, for this holiday. That's the, yep. the main idea from this chart, right? So all of the elements that didn't exactly give me uh, insight, that didn't give me a proper way of looking at it, so like I mentioned, like the y-axis, the vertical bars, the 3D uh, uh, bars uh, columns them themselves, let's, let's get rid of that. Let's change the font to something more simple. Everything is bolded, everything is 
uh, harder to read the fact that the elements on the x-axis are also like uh, uh, to to a degree makes them a bit harder to read so let's simplify everything put it into perspective and uh, get to the point yeah what's, what's the analysis it's really interesting because the information is the same i mean the only exactly difference the is the title which she it's her conclusion the title aside it's the exact same information but this is so much easier to to look at <laughs> yeah right <laughs> and read yeah yeah and uh, that's just uh you're looking at just one chart usually uh there's different definitions for this but when we say dashboard we refer to having not just one element one chart there's a bunch of charts a bunch of tables uh, any type of elements that can help you analyze the certain thing you're trying to analyze should i trust the charts that i see is there any way to lie with charts yes there is willingfully or unwillingfully there's a plethora of ways uh, for which you can lie with charts can you look at an example yeah for sure so when we're talking about design with a chart uh, maybe for a ease of an example just think about a bar chart right everybody knows how a bar chart looks okay uh, you have several elements on a chart uh, outside of maybe what's obvious right you have the y-axis the x-axis you have a title you have the actual bar charts maybe some data labels that uh, enunciate what the value of a certain bar chart is mm -hmm. and you can manipulate some of these elements to better sell the story you're trying to sell these are some examples of what i meant by saying by poor design right mm -hmm. so looking at the first one this would be the correct version and then the deceptive version here we're highlighting the percentage of percentage of population with access to safe drinking water just mm -hmm. a random example on the internet right so the way they so they sold this news uh this is actually i think something that uh, appeared in the uh, news in america at some so point this is like a real example of it's a re real which... example between willow town and silver town to to uh, stay two towns in, uh, in america so this is what appeared in the in the news right you see the comparison between the two towns a few pinpoints right right from the go there's no y-axis right so there's nothing to tell you exactly what is the comparison between the two but you definitely from the get-go see that one is much bigger than the other yeah, right yeah, yeah so the idea being that hey uh, our town is much better or uh well, Willow Town has uh, seen better days, uh, and this is another town to compare it with. But if you look then to the correct version, you then realize that the difference is much smaller than what's shown here, yeah. just because they don't show the y-axis, right? And they want to highlight the point. What's happening is that actually, if you were to have an y-axis here, you'd see it doesn't start from zero, which is usually what you would, yeah. you would, uh, your brain would tell you from the get-go. So the difference is about three percentages not as high as yeah. uh, they want to, to communicate to you right so just they zoom in zoomed in basically they just zoom exactly in. that's a very <laughs> on the slice that they very good way of putting it right so you you don't take the data from a proper point of view you zoom into it a, a lot to yeah. highlight the idea the the point you're trying to sell and maybe to to stick, take a few steps back from this so the reason why things like this happen is because uh, charts, graphs, uh, these big numbers that you see, especially on TV, they're extremely compelling, right? Mm -hmm. so when co somebody comes and says, you know, I, I know the truth and this is the data to sustain it, from the get-go, your reaction is to trust that person because, hey, he did research, he has the tools to show it. So, yeah. uh, so these type of, uh, this type of communication via, via charts is very powerful. It has the, the potential to be very powerful. And of course, where there's power, there's also people that want to use that power for, uh, for their own benefit. So uh, that's why we're gonna see uh, a lot of stuff like that. Things that you might see, and you're kind of going to verge with the marketing area of things, okay. is that you take the data, it is truthful and the graphs will be accurate. But mm -hmm. for example, one thing that comes to mind is about uh, the pharmaceutical companies okay right so they show some charts and they say uh, they divide they split the data to a degree that it becomes so niche so specific that it is true but then you have to ask yourself about the relevance so for oh, example okay. we're the top seller in the eastern uh, region for products that only sell to hospitals yeah right so there's so many criteria there that you have to wonder all right so uh, how many uh competitors are in this contest that you're making, you're ranking yourself there, because when you're gonna drill down, you're gonna see that's maybe four or five companies, yeah, and you're yeah. on first place, all right. I mean, it's not a lie. I mean, this reminded me of something when um, I used to work uh, 
in a certain company and we had one of the sets of data, mm -hmm. pools of data we looked at was this attrition mm -hmm. area, like how many people are leaving the company, what people, what seniorities, what departments, what disciplines, after how much time in the company, for what reasons and so on. And depending on how much you dug into the data and how you chose to kind of look at it and understand mm -hmm. it, the same situation could appear to be bad or not so bad or actually quite positive <laughs> or mm -hmm. you could look at some um, some data and in, in a certain way it, it felt like things were improving and in yep. other ways it felt like it wasn't improving. It was very confusing because mm -hmm. you could look at the same data in, in different ways depending on your perspective and what you chose to highlight in certain situations. So It's not easy, no. Uh, and this reminds me of a uh uh, quote, I, I forgot the offer, but I like this quote a lot. It's, uh, he said, if you torture the data long enough, it will confess to anything. Yeah. And it's exactly in sort of like the example that I gave with the pharmaceutical companies as well, right? So if you split it and uh, divide it uh, enough, looking for that specific angle that you're looking at, you can get there. Yeah. You can yeah. get there. So it's always a balance to try to be truthful to uh, what you're showing in these, uh, in these images. and. What is your aim with them? Because if the aim is not that we want to look at the data and show the truth, but we have a message and we just want to use the data to support that message, that's a territory I wouldn't like to be in. So part of your job is to not only come up with technical solutions or how to visualize data, but also to kind of think how to best take some complex data and simplify it in a way which yep. is simpler, but still truthful and proportional to the actual detail which maybe people don't have the patience to look at so you have to simplify it but yeah. simplification not uh not, not lose the essence of it i guess yeah so i would say my job is sort of like i would maybe divide it in two for for ease of understanding there's all of the back-end stuff that happens before we get to these uh oh, okay. to these yeah, visualizations it's yeah so it's, it's just like looking the data storing it making sure the data quality is as you expected making sure everybody understands the same thing by the same definitions because mm -hmm. that can be a big uh, big issue and uh after all of this is done and triple verified and we we can be sure that we can depend on that data then there's the second part of the job, which is more the data analysis part, which implies a lot, a lot of communication. You have to discuss with a lot of people, make sure everybody, like I said, understands the same thing. And then according to, there's industries where these type of uh, metrics and analysis are standardized, and that's perfect. Oh, okay. You can just, everybody in the industry agrees that this is the metric we're trying to follow. This is not always the case with the companies we, we work with. Mm -hmm. Sometimes their product is maybe more innovative or newer to the market. And then you're in a position where you kind of have to, okay, define these metrics. How do we, how do we measure our performance? And mm -hmm. it's a back and forth of, I understand it like this, I understand it like that. Uh, we had projects where even simpler questions like, what was the revenue that we had last month? According to the, part, the department you asked, marketing would give you a number, finance would give you another number, um, uh, software development would give you a different number if they're also involved in this. So aligning all of these metrics company-wide uh, is uh, one of the big tasks we, we challenge ourselves with. Yeah. So th that makes me think of the two-way relationship between charts and, and visualizing information and business processes. Yeah. Because in theory, on paper, and we know that doesn't happen, but on paper, you should get your input from the business processes. So mm -hmm. they should tell you, okay, this is what you measure, this is why you measure it, this is the, the way we measure it, and you just make it show up on the screen. Yep. But my, if I understand correctly what you're saying, sometimes you trying to come up with the right charts and ways to visualize data raises questions that the business hasn't yet answered. They yeah, could be, could they be. They don't yeah. have a formula for that, they don't have a process for that. So you also input into them and sort of make them realize that they need to clarify some things and come up with some answers. Definitely. So I think the best charts make you see uh, things from a different perspective. Uh, so they tell stories that you cannot innately come up with. You see it in a chart and then you're, uh, you start asking yourself questions about these things. And I think that's a good sign. But it's, it's a process. It's not a done deal. You've done it and it's over. You know, you have iterations, you go back and forth, you decide on Again, what's fair, what's accurate, what we align with. And this happens a couple of times. And then you decide, okay, at least for now, for this iteration of the, the report, this is the version we're going to follow. I wanted to give you another example about uh, charts. Another way in which people sometimes, uh, let's say, lie with them is that they show you 
insufficient data. So there's nothing wrong with the chart and there's nothing wrong with the data, but it's sort of, again, so zoomed in in one particular uh, niche that it's not, it's not truthful. Mm -hmm. So there's this, uh, this cool book, it's called How Charts Lie. Uh, <laughs> I couldn't put it, yeah. It's uh, written by Alberto Cairo. He's um, a journalist. Uh, I think he's uh, Spanish descent, but he's, he's living in the United States. And he has a lot of examples in this book and I very neatly organized by uh, different criteria. Mm -hmm. And some of the examples we're discussing today are, are from that book as well. Many of them, not all of them, but many of them are in the political spectrum because uh, when the book was written, um, Trump was president and a lot of uh, interesting communications came from that time. During uh, Obama's uh, term, mm -hmm. he uh, issued this policy that was called DACA. DACA stands for Deferent Action for Children Arrivals. So it has to do with uh, illegal aliens, particularly from, from Mexico. What this uh, policy said is that if these illegal aliens are children, so are underage, we're gonna give them protection and a uh, work permit. So a DACA recipient is such a, such a person. Uh -huh. When Obama's term was over, they uh, nulled it. They got it out, and this is the main reason, the main chart they used to legitimize this decision. So what they're saying is that, you know, from all of the DACA recipients, over 2,000 uh, ended up being felons uh, or uh, convicted, co convicts in, in America after they got the work permits and everything else. When you're just looking at this number, right? So in the book, he has also a great quote that is, uh, a chart shows only what a chart shows. Mm -hmm. So if this number is big or if this number is small, you don't get from this chart. Yeah. Or you're getting it as a number, right? So is 2000 a big number or 2000 a small number? Well, now because we're talking about this, my mind is, you know, aware of these things and the answer is going to be, I don't know, I don't have the context, but if exactly. you're glancing at something like this. It's very easy to sell it, right? So the truth is that uh, the number of uh, DACA recipients in all of its existence is around 800,000. Okay. So uh, if you are to do the math, the percentage of people that actually ended up being felons is somewhere around 0.3%. Then you would have to compare that percentage with a percentage of people which are not DACA recipients to put it even to more context. Uh, yes. We'll get into that oh, okay. quite soon, but I'm just saying like right from the get go, right? You're saying 2000, it sounds like, oh, that's, that's a lot of, if you imagine in front of you like 2000 people, that's a lot of people, right? Mm -hmm. But when I'll tell you that it's out of all, everybody that received this, it's 0.3%, then this uh, gets another connotation entirely. So what he did also in this example is that he took it he put it in a different perspective, right? So if you take every 1,000 DACA recipients, free from one, uh, free uh, people from every 1,000 uh, sample uh, ended up being with a, a felon or a, or a convict. And this is the comparison with 1,000 voting age people who live in the US, right? So normal people, okay. non-aliens, okay. which is actually much higher than the illegal aliens. So there's some debate to have, if you want to have it, if this number is big and maybe we should drop it down and what we can do in that, in that area. But if the point of this chart, the point of this data is to tell you that the policy was bad because we had so many uh, DACA recipients that ended up felons, it just isn't true. This one other thing you mentioned was confirmation bias. Yep. And confirmation bias and a whole other bunch of selection biases are something I work with a lot in. Mm -hmm. So leadership soft skills area. Yep. So an, an example of a confirmation bias when it comes to, to that area would be if, if I form an opinion about an individual that mm -hmm. they're, I don't know, disorganized, for example, then I will tend to see the examples when they're disorganized disproportionately yep. compared to the instances where they are organized or compared to other people. Mm -hmm. So I will see, I will tend to see how Again, he's disorganized again, he's disorganized again, and I will reinforce my belief, mm -hmm. and it's like a cycle that, if, if you're not careful, you can get the wrong impression about things. Yeah. So how, how does this apply? In, so I'll go on your example. Your, I think yeah. exactly the same things happens with, uh, can happen with data as well. Like Im imagine I would do an analysis on that particular person you're thinking about, and I'll show you a line chart that only shows his worst performing days. Oh, okay. And this, because you have that confirmation bias, you already have your opinion in your mind and you have a graph that kind of confirms what you're already thinking. 
uh, you're already sold on the idea. So this kind of makes you be a bit less objective and less accurate on uh, what you're trying to communicate. The DACA example I gave is also something you can see perfectly uh, affected by a confirmation bias because if you're, let's say, uh, again, not to get political, but you're against immigration, you feel like the immigration problem is out of control, it doesn't even matter what the numbers are, right? I'm showing you a big number, big, 2,000, and it's like, I knew it. Yeah, I knew uh -huh. it. This was one this more situation. proof that I was right. Yes. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. One more, one, more, one more argument for me to, to show people I'm right. We understand what the right thing to do is, right? I mean, uh, listening to you talking, you, you know, you get an idea, but, but it's so difficult to, every, every time you see a piece of information, every time you read an article, every time someone says something, for you to be so disciplined, okay, let me take a step back, let me take some notes, let me consider the data they're presenting, mm -hmm. you know, let me do my own research. I mean, yeah. it's very difficult to do that. So what can people do? So it is they, very difficult, and I think it's getting more and more difficult. I, I keep uh, reading articles about it and seeing people uh, older than me confessing the same stuff that, for example, you know, news 20 years ago were news. It was just somebody very uh, stoically, let's, let's say, you know, putting out some facts, and nobody was judging if this is accurate or not. And, you know, as time went along, now it's very old news uh, are sort of partisan to something or they, they have a point to sell or they have, you know, sponsors that, yeah, I would say, first of all, have a look at the chart uh, and see if, you know, it, it makes sense because after you see a few examples of this or especially after you, you go through that book that I, that I mentioned, you, it's in your mind, you're always looking, okay, is the, are they trying to manipulate these basic elements, first of all, in any way that seems unfair? And if uh, that's the case, that would be a first red flag. I would be very weary of any type of analysis that includes charts that doesn't specify somewhere the source. Okay. If you're just showing a chart of data and you're not telling us it's based on ONU or any other type of organization or whatever you got the data from, why would you do that, right? So that's another red flag. And uh, try to find uh, different uh, sources that analyze the same thing and see if there's any type of consensus there. Yeah, it is hard. It is hard. I understand on a day-to-day -day basis, we just we don't have time for this. I think an immediate useful advice would be try at least to vet your sources, right? So maybe you have a couple of uh, agencies, maybe some people you really trust. Uh, there's a few sites that are specifically uh, dedicated towards, you know, doing uh, fact fair you know. fact-checking and fair and accurate analysis of certain uh, statistic elements. So try to do that and then curate your feed, whatever you're getting this on LinkedIn, on Facebook, whatever, try to, if you're seeing publications that consistently put out stuff that is uh, inaccurate, maybe try to exclude that from your list and keep the, the ones that are uh, more fair. And in this way, you make sure somehow that uh, the information that's getting your way is more you know, true. Yeah. Again, very difficult in the narrow fake news. It is, it is, but even more than fake news, fake news is, in a way, sort of the extreme example, but yeah. much simpler example. I'm preparing for to run a semi-marathon, and I have this watch, and I'm tracking my mm -hmm. progress, and it measures all kinds of, let's call them KPIs, right? Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Um, and I, I think I have 10, 12, 15 data points it shows me every day and after every run. Uh, and they're not all equally relevant. Mm -hmm. And they're not all equally relevant at the same time in my progress I, I, towards achieving what I want to achieve it can get overwhelming. Even, even this little thing, like you're, you know, you're trying to do some yeah. sports and you're trying to pay attention to all the dashboards it shows you. And if you want to, it, it can be overwhelming. Even something as simple as that, which is not lying to you, it's very simple data. Yeah, in yeah, way, yeah. But you have to pick it. You have to decide what's important to you, I guess, on some, yeah. based on your objective, I guess. Yeah, that would be also so again, the, the cognitive load aspect comes to mind, right? Yeah, it's, just, yeah. it's a bit overwhelming, it's too much information. So yeah, what I would do in this particular case is try to figure out what's most important to you and yeah. look at those things. So the, the general perception when you say reporting is you're looking at a set of data that has happened, right? 2023 is over. Let's analyze what happened in 2023. Mm -hmm. There's no, no new data coming in, right? The year is over. And you look at all of the data and you do all of your type of analysis. And then the report is an uh, actual piece of paper that shows you the graphs alongside with the conclusion, right? The storytelling part. This is what we found out. Uh, and that's 
part of our job. We sometimes do it, but mostly I would say our job is related to what I would call operational reports. Operational reports meaning that you're looking at data that is much more fresh. I would say on average, maybe 85% of the cases are done on a daily batch. So the next morning you come in the office, you can see what happened yesterday. Okay. Every day we're reloading this data and refreshing these reports. And this brings some extra challenges because opposed to having, you know, the data set that is not going to change, you know exactly how charts are going to look, how are they going to uh, be perceived. When there's new data and you know, don't know how that data is going to show, you also don't know how the charts are going to show. So we kind of have to prepare for that to be a bit more uh, lenient with the, with the story and let people, especially people that are more adapt in the industry we're working on, find the story themselves. But of course, whenever we, uh, we are possible to also add the storytelling element, we, uh, we try to do that. Yeah, so the storytelling element would be the conclusion. Yeah. Like, yeah it's yeah. good, it's bad, it's growing, it's not growing, you're doing better than the competition. Overall, the whole, the whole way you pack that information, the chart alongside the, the, the little text that pinpoints you to that exact conclusion. Yeah. Or maybe even some actions that might be recommended uh, as a consequence of the data, right? Like, you, you, should, you should do this. Exactly, exactly. If you're lucky enough to be able to do uh, prescriptive analytics, uh, which is exactly what you're referring to, then yes, also okay, so suggestion. I just found out what they're called. So descriptive is when you, you just tell what, what happened. Tell me what happened. The, the second one would be sort of like forecasting. You're, you're trying to predict, so predictive, what's going to happen next. And prescriptive is not only what's going to happen next, but what, also what you should do to get the outcome you're, uh, you're looking at. But prescriptive, I would say, is more also in the territory of our colleagues from data science, where machine learning models can give you more accurate uh, predictions of what's, uh, what's going to occur. Can we export to Excel? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so this is one of, uh, another one of those memes. So the, the idea behind this is that um, as a data analyst, let's say you work very hard to curate that data to make sure everybody aligns on the definitions, everybody aligns on the metric. You spend a lot of time in the uh, exploratory phase to try to see what works best, what will be the best chart. Maybe you do some, um, some testing with stakeholders in the company. Do we agree? Does this look good? Can we release it to the other employees? And uh, you know, it's all this work and then you, you put it there and you're proud, let's say, of your work. Uh, and the immediate question then is, uh, it's, it's perfect, we like it a lot, but can we export this to Excel? Uh, which is sort of like what we're trying to get rid of or, or um, do less because that's the point, right? We're doing all of this stuff, so you don't have to do it in Excel. You get it, you uh, understand the uh, explanation there, and then you use it in your job to take better decisions. That's the point. But I also understand that like, uh, Excel is being, I think, is the most used tool. Over 1 billion users, uh, people are... <laughs> are not going to give up Excel, you know, uh, we kind of have to find a compromise between uh, happily or uh, fortunately, let's say, all of the tools, uh, Power BI, Tableau, ClickSense, and every, everything that's on the market now also offers the uh, possibility to export it to Excel. Yeah. Uh, sometimes people need the data to combine it with some other data that maybe is not yet available to you as a data analyst. So uh, there's a, sometimes a very legit, uh, legitimate reason to do that. Sometimes people just feel the need to do the math themselves to be sure on the, on the results. And I can understand that as well. Yeah, I mean, Excel gives you a lot of flexibility. You yep. can take the data and do whatever you want to do with it. I guess the other side of the coin would be that you guys work so hard to uh, simplify it, systemize it, reach an agreed standard, and then mm -hmm. everybody does their own thing. And again, we get into sort of, let's call it chaos territory. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, I don't think you can remove Excel. I mean, I'm not a data analyst, no. but just like, like you said, by seeing how widespread it is, there was another meme I remember that half of the IT industry is run on COBOL and Excel. Yeah. And all yeah, these yeah, modern, yeah. fancy, sexy things, they're just yeah. all based on COBOL and Excel at, at some level. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think I can uh, attest to that fact as well. So, of course, there's, there's uh, a lot of marketing and a lot of, you know, very interesting stuff out there. My experience is, uh, you know, the reality in the market is a bit different. We're still, you know, getting there, getting there. What is your favorite graph and why is it the pie chart? Yeah, yeah, why yeah. Is it, why is your favorite <laughs> graph the pie chart? Yeah, so it's, uh, the title is a bit sarcastic. 
So, uh, so you don't mean it, right? No, 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 no I okay. don't mean it. Uh, we live in the meme age, and uh, memes, of course, landed in uh, the data analysts, uh, the data analysis land as well. And uh, it's one of the memes you're going to see most often is about pie charts and uh, okay. uh, about them. Let's let's start with the uh, positives about it, right? So a pie chart, what's very good at a pie chart, the, the main uh, strong point that a pie chart has is that it very easily shows you the percentage of the whole. Mm -hmm. So when you're looking at something and you see that this is the biggest part of the, the, the pie chart, you know that that's the most significant category that you're analyzing in that. That being said, everything other than that kind of makes it hard to read because the moment you have more than three categories, let's see in a pie chart, you can imagine a pie chart that is divided in 10 slices. Yeah. It is very difficult to, to, to look and see, okay, this part is bigger than this one, maybe. And even if you do, uh, sometimes uh, you cannot really tell by how much. Mm -hmm. So maybe I can tell that this is bigger, but I cannot tell it's 20%, 30%, 45%. So that's, I would say, the main argument against it. Of course, there's also some sort of bias because now it's like a, a joke, but that's the main argument against it. And um, also it kind of covers up a lot of real estate. We're dealing with limited real estate, right? Like I mentioned, decluttering and all that stuff. You want to use your space to, to, to the most of your advantage. And I think my, my last argument would be there's a lot of better alternatives uh, to it there. Like for, for me personally, I think if you have a bar chart that has the percentages, it's much easier to tell who's the, to do the ranking, right? Who's on top, who has the biggest part. And also when you're comparing the, the bars by how much uh, each of them uh, differs between each other. Okay. And I just want to mention there uh, some reactions sometimes on internet. It's like, I'm not using pie charts, I'm using donut chart which is pretty much the same thing, but with a big hole in it. It's uh, <laughs> the same criteria as applying.